All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this morning, we've got two guests joining us, and we're going to start uh, with Aaron Gregory, who's with uh, Creston Valley Kootenai Lake Economic Action Partnership. And last week, when Elizabeth Quinn joined us, she was speaking about the transitional camp for um, workers coming during harvest. And there were certainly some questions. So we've invited Aaron to provide us with some more information and an overview of where things are at. So welcome, Aaron and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Molly. So, all I mentioned, my name is Aaron Gregory and I'm the Community Economic Development Coordinator for the EAP. The EAP put forward a proposal to the Ministry of Agriculture about a month ago explaining the, to the Canadian Migrant Worker Challenge. And so many of, some of you may know, many of the Canadian migrant workers, they come to the Crescent Valley when they arrive and some of them are looking for work. and then they don't have access to accommodations, which they then have to camp in public or private land. And given COVID-19 and what is going on in the world, this is going to be a big issue this year. Now, the EAP received, received funds from the Ministry of Agriculture to source two sites, as well as provide camp operations and supplies to those sites. So our target group for the migrant workers are going to be people who are not working and don't have access to accommodations on and camp on public or private land. Our camp is not replacing any of the on any of the farmers on site accommodations. Our first so our first site is located at Cozy RV Park, which is a few minutes outside of Preston in Ariston. It's equipped with showers, bathrooms, laundry facilities, as well as a kitchen area. We're planning on charging five dollars a night and our maximum capacity is 50 to allow us to with plenty of room for social distancing and any other of the health and safety protocols that are that have been put in place we also want to put up a job board for people to access different jobs such like a board that cs would have but this would be specifically for farmers or for the for the migrant workers so then they could have access to some of the jobs locally and so a direct link linkage between the, the farmers in the valley will be important as we can see how to, how to get these people into, into the job. So regarding COVID, we will be utilizing all the necessary health and safety protocols, the hand sanitizing, making sure that there are too many people in the washroom, lots of cleaning, sanitizing, and COVID-19 training for the workers and, and people managing the camp, and any other health and safety protocols that have been dictated by the provincial health office. And I have been working really closely with Interior Health just to make sure that we have any other health, health and safety uh, measures in place as well as developing different, any other protocols that we need to do. In addition, we are looking for a second site. So if anybody has any potential locations or areas that might be a good spot to accommodate some of these transient workers, please reach out to me. I can put my, co my contact information in chat for you. And that's pretty much the overview of the camp. I would like to open the floor to any questions that you may have. Great, thanks, Aaron. Are there any further questions? Um, some of you were able to hear Aaron speak um, on Friday about the camp. So just if there isn't anyone else who'd like to speak, you can certainly unmute yourself or use uh, the chat box. All right, you got an easy crowd, Aaron. It looks like. Uh... <laughs> and then also just send, send me, I'll put my email there as well. So don't, don't hesitate to send me an email too. Excellent. Well, thanks for providing information both this week and, and last uh, to the group and clarifying where things will be. Um, if there's any questions that come up later, uh, we can certainly pass those on to you. Sure, sure, of course. Great. All right, well, thanks, Erin. You're welcome to stay for the presentation Dr. Toivonen's making, but I know you've also got a busy day ahead, so. Well, thanks, you guys. Great, have a good day. All right, well, thank you. Um, thanks, Erin, and I see a number of colleagues have joined us also from the Okanagan, so we've got a, a good group here for your presentation, Peter. And uh, if you'd like to do your screen share, we can move directly there. So 
Many of you know Dr. Toivonen, uh, who works at the Summerland Research Station in uh, post-harvest handling and post-harvest quality. And so we're very happy to have him here today to be able to talk to us about uh, maintaining the quality of fruit during the cherry harvest and after the harvest as well. So I believe I can turn it over to you. Let me just unmute your, um, I think your microphone might still be muted here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, let's do that. Perfect. Okay. Great. I'll learn this eventually, I guess. <laughs> no problem. We all are this year, it seems. Okay. Uh, I, I was asked to give a talk today. I think this talk is basically a repeat of many talks that I've done over the years, but I think at this time of year, it's, it's a good thing to sit down and reflect on managing quality. Uh, and uh, this information doesn't grow old, sometimes just to remind people. So forgive me if there's, these are things you've heard before, but uh, these are things that we need to keep on thinking about constantly. Uh, I'll let's see if I get this moving. Uh, okay. Maintaining quality in sweet cherries, it requires a lot of attention. Uh, right from the time that you take the fruit off the tree uh, up to the time you deliver it to the receiving area or, or the packing house, uh, it's a uh, it's detail, everything's detail, and every minor detail can make a big difference for quality in the end. Uh, there are four main factors that determine quality, uh, and I'll talk about two of those today, because that was what I was asked to talk about. But we have to keep in mind that the initial quality of the tree is important, and uh, we have a new scientist at uh, Summerlin, Dr. Hao Zhu, who's starting to work on, on that, uh, that issue, and that's things for her to talk about. And then uh, minimizing mechanical injuries during the picking and packing operation is extremely important. I'll talk a little bit about that today. And reducing the time between picking and packing is very important when you can do it. And there's also uh, an, a component of this, which is protecting the cherries after harvest, which gives you a bit of time uh, from, from getting it off the tree to the packing house or the receiving cooling area. And I won't really talk about temperature management. I spoke with uh, Molly before this uh, meeting, and, and uh, I think most of that is in hand with the, the growers in Creston. I think you've got uh, protocols that seem to be optimal in terms of handling the fruit from, from Creston down to the Okanagan for uh, packing and final cooling. One of the things we always have to think about is that we harvest these fruit at the hottest time of year, just about, and uh, and a lot of times uh, we have a block that is relatively uniform in maturity, which means those fruit are coming on at about the same time. The larger the orchard, the more fruit you have to get off in a very short period of time. Often the orchard is a distance from the packing house or receiving station. In the case of Creston, it's quite a ways off for the packing house. Uh, and quite often packers are packing for many orchards and more so than in the past and different growers. And, and so the volume and uh, speed to cooling can make it difficult to manage quality, especially if you have orchards that are all coming off at the same time. Temperature, I told, spoke about that a few seconds ago, is is extremely important factor in what happens with cherries and what has to happen with cherries. We look at the respiration uh, rate of sweet cherries and the temperatures we usually uh, handle fruit. We're looking at uh, rates of respiration that are probably about uh, four or five times higher than apple when we're typically harvesting apples. So the challenges for cherries are much greater than they are for apple. At the time we harvest the fruit from the tree, the cherries are detached. Uh, from the tree and uh, at that point in time there's no more water or sugars going into the fruit so that's the end of the, of the tree providing uh, sustenance to that fruit and because of that we have to be concerned about maintaining the water content particularly in, in the fruit after it's removed from the tree. We remove the cherries from a, a shade or partial shade condition when on the tree 
and a moderate humidity inside the canopy of the tree. And then we expose it to a hot sun and low relative humidity. And this time of year, sometimes the humidity can be down to 25% or so. So that's, you know, we're, we're really putting the, the fruit from a reasonably good situation into a very, very stressful situation. So the cherries can heat up, they can respire more, which reduces the acids and sugars in the fruit, which is the quality of the fruit. And more often what we see is stems are damaged by the sun exposure and brown stem is probably one of the earliest indications of problems with stress in cherries. Differences in pitting, uh, maturity is an important issue. We, we, we've done, done this work many years ago and, and we repeat it every so often, but we find that uh, as we go up, uh, up in maturity, actual pitting is reduced in the fruit. Uh, now that's applying a uniform pitting type injury to the fruit. Uh, and, and if there are differences in handling of the fruit at harvest, those probably would overshadow what we're seeing here. However, we know that applying GA, which I think all of you apply GA to your fruit, you're minimizing the level of pitting. These are two GA points on this curve. So application of GA is important. What do we do for maturity? Well, okay, we want to be as far advanced as we can to minimize the potential for pitting, but we'll talk about some other considerations in terms of what maturity should be for harvest. And this is one of them. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, okay. Um, we look at a canopy management, for instance. Uh, we've done some work in the past showing that uh, poor canopy management, where we have very deeply shaded canopies, we tend to have a lot of problems. One of the most obvious problems is, of course, that we have powdery mildew and actually we have more pitting when when the fruit is on, under uh, a, a dark uh, canopy uh, light so those are two things physically that happen with the fruit but also uh, when we have good canopy management uh, it doesn't matter what maturity you harvest on we don't have a lot of soft soft fruit which is an important consideration in the marketplace so if you have a very well managed orchard with a good light penetration into the canopy, you don't tend to have problems and you can harvest your fruit later without having the same risk as you might if you didn't have the optimal canopy management we start to see as we get more mature in the harvest in terms of color maturity that uh, we get a lot more soft fruit. And this is uh, just a, a, a factor that the, f the fruit that's grown in a, in a uh, dark canopy uh, is really much more tender than fruit that's grown in, in open canopy situations. Logistics is probably the most important thing to think about. And the further ahead you can think about it, the better. You, you need to consider how fast fruit will fill a bin and how, many, how long cherries will be warmer and protected in the bin. So we, we need to think about what's going on in the orchard as we're harvesting the fruit. Uh, we need to uh, take a chronological approach to filling the bins and ensuring that the fruit aren't exposed to sun and low humidity. And uh, one, one of the things I talk about with chronological is the first fruit off the tree should be the first fruit into uh, the packing house or the receiving cooling area. And if you don't have a chronological approach, then you will have some fruit that are exposed to stressful conditions for longer than other fruit. And as a consequence, you'll start to see anomalies in terms of quality in the marketplace. Uh, we like to think about, we need to get the cherries off as fast as we can and into the packing house as fast as we can. But in reality, we know that that's not really always possible or in some cases hardly ever possible. So we have to be a little bit more realistic in our uh, attitudes about what, what we should try to do in terms of handling cherries. But the first thing we have to keep in mind is this logistics plan I just talked about. And, but you have to plan ahead of time as much as you can so that there are no surprises. Have a, a system out there as to how swampers collect the, the bins 
and how they communicate with the pickers to ensure that the fruit that are coming off are, are, are moved to the receiving area or the packing house as quickly as possible. And the reflective tarps, which has um, really been adopted very well here in BC, and I think they're starting to look at adoption in, in the US instead of doing in-field hydrocooling uh, to protect the fruit. Uh, and it actually can buy you a lot of time if you use these tarps. Uh, and, and so take away some of that stress that you may have. When talking about logistics, we also have to think about making sure our, our pickers or harvesters are, are trained. They need to know how to do this job properly, otherwise they can do more harm to the fruit uh, than good. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, when pickers are picking the fruit, that the picking container is very close to them. Uh, and so they're not dropping the fruit like they might be in other situations. You have to make sure that they are standing squarely on, on, a, on a properly situated ladder so they're not feeling uh, like they're, they're uh, going to fall off that ladder so they're comfortable and so they're able to do their, their picking uh, appropriately. Uh, and they have to learn how to feel through the, the, uh, the uh, fruit as they're harvesting remove the fruit from the tree by the stem, not by picking the fruit or pulling the fruit, which leads to problems with uh, stemless fruit and bruising on the cherries as well. Uh, this is a picture just showing what are kind of tolerable drops for, for cherries. The top edge of your picking container is the, the limit of how far you should drop your cherry. I don't recommend that. I would rather they drop, drop uh, within the bucket, not at the edge. But if if you have to, to say what your limit is, it's the top edge of your bucket. Ladder placement, I think spending time on ladder placement is an important thing. If you have pickers that are not adept at this or who are not trained, a lot of your uh, major job of getting a good, good harvest is ensuring that the ladders are placed appropriately to, to allow the picker to be comfortable to feel like they're uh, on a stable uh, uh, platform when they're picking uh, so they don't have to worry about where they're gonna fall and they can focus on removing the fruit from the tree. This is all contained within a uh, picker training uh, manual that I put together a few years ago. If you need copies of that, Molly, just let me know and I'll, I'll send copies of that. I have that in English, French, and Spanish. And uh, this is uh, Greg, Greg Norton showing us how to um, uh, place ladders, uh, whether we put ladders in with uh, the, uh, uh, the steps into the, uh, into, into the tree where we're picking fruit from the outside of the tree or whether we're putting a, uh, the, the uh, support, ladder support into the, the tree to allow us to bring the ladder close to the canopy. So, Training, training the pickers to, to get their ladder placed so that they have a comfortable uh, uh, capability to pick fruit from the tree is an important aspect of uh, picker training. We've done a lot of work with uh, what can cause damage to the fruit. And I mentioned earlier that you shouldn't drop a cherry any further than the top edge of a container, whether it's one of these containers, a pail or a kidney bucket. Uh, we did some work with different uh, varieties and we know that some varieties get more pitting injury uh, from drops and that the, the pale and the kidney bucket are these two lines up here with the sweetheart cherry, oops. Um, so we know that these are harsher containers than uh, this corrugated plastic. And I know there's another bucket out there or a pail out there that uh, manufactured in the US that was designed for uh, blush cherries and it's very soft on the fruit. Lapins is fairly resilient. Uh, this is a blush cherry which is a little bit less resilient uh, than, uh, than, than lapins but uh, something like Sweetheart has a greater propensity for getting pitting with drops and you'll notice we have drop heights here and we're looking at the major pitting happening when we have drop heights about 50 centimeters, which is about uh, 20 inches. I, I think we need to keep our drops down down to the 20 centimeter mark, which is the top of the pail, or I guess it's about eight inches. Uh, I'll see if 
I can play these. Uh, this, this is to this to demonstrate the kind of noises you hear when you go from the most extreme draw pipe down to the least extreme draw pipe. Just to give you an idea, when you're walking out in the orchard, is there somebody that's dropping these cherries too far distance or not? Let's see if I can play this. Can you hear that, Molly? It's a little quiet, Peter, and we're also just struggling a little to hear your voice. I'm not sure if it if you're close enough to your speaker. Maybe I'll try to pull up my my earbuds and see. If oh, I maybe. Okay. Oh, we're getting a little bit of feedback there. Perhaps try that now. Oh no. better no i think that's actually not not quite as loud now so is that better um try again please can you hear me better now Is that better? It still seems quite faint. Faint? Yeah. Sorry. I don't know what else I can do here. Okay. Um, maybe I'll... Uh, uh, I'll put on my voice as loud as I can get it using controls here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, That's better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll try this again. This is where you want the sound, where you don't have any more resonance going on. So you, you can tell when it's uh, from the high drop that you have uh, basically like a, a sort of re resonance when the, the cherry falls onto the bucket. So if you're walking through the orchard and you hear that kind of a sound, you know, they're dropping their fruit from far too much, too, from a too high, high height. And if you want to modify an existing uh, pail, you can use closed cell, closed cell polyurethane foam, about a quarter inch thick, and it, it can be used uh, causes some problems for food safety issues, but if it's polyurethane, you can wash it down. Re results of poor picking style. That's, that's, you, can, you can see the out outcomes of a, a poorly trained picker or a novice picker. And one of the big things we find that, that uh, get more bruised fruit, um, largely because they're handling the fruit instead of the stem when they harvest the fruit. So when they, when they squeeze the, the fruit, they're bruising it. And as a consequence, we tend to get uh, more fruit with rot in the, in the pack out after it's uh, been uh, go, uh, in storage or, or shipped for about four weeks. So that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Is if you can teach the pickers to properly pick the fruit, they have less uh, uh, handling of, of the fruit itself. And therefore, uh, you don't tend to have the same kind of uh, uh, rot and actually you tend not to have as many soft fruit as well. Um, the other aspect of, of this is uh, fast pickers and slow pickers and tend to you tend to have less uh, uh, established cherries if you have slower pickers so sometimes being too fast uh, causes uh, the fruit to be picked carelessly and as a consequence the stems get separated from the fruit uh, over uh, the picking process. Um, and just a reminder, there's, there's two major areas where we get pitting occurring on cherries and you can point fingers at the pickers, you can point fingers at uh, the packing house, but 
when it comes down to it, uh, both the picker and the packing house are contributing uh, equally to fitting. So both sides have to spend time looking at what they're doing in terms of handling the cherries to minimize the picking, uh, picking induced or uh, packing line induced pitting. Every transfer causes problems. In this case, they're trying to uh, drop the cherries into the bin from a very uh, low uh, height, which is what you try to do as much as you can to minimize the, the bruising that's caused. This one, they're dropping it from a larger height, which I don't recommend. Uh, and so every time you drop the cherries, doesn't matter how gentle you are, there's still gonna be some bruising. There's still gonna be some bruising here, but there'll be more bruising in this situation. So keep attention to that. And if you can minimize the number of transfers that you do in the orchard, that'll minimize the amount of damage to the cherries before it's received at the packing house. As I mentioned just a second ago, every transfer uh, leads to, to new bruising injury in the field. It doesn't matter how gentle you are. Uh, impact bruising, which is drops of the hard surfaces, are, increases when the temperatures are cooler. This is why we see more uh, problems with pitting once it gets to the packing house. Uh, impact bruising increases with drop heights, so therefore we have to train our pickers to minimize the drop heights we, we uh, have when we pick the fruit into the bucket or the pail or picking container. And if we can find picking containers uh, uh, that are designed to be soft, in other words, to absorb that shock when the fruit drops onto that surface, that improves the situation quite a bit. Another aspect that I don't talk about an awful lot, which is very important, is compression bruising. And this kind of bruising increases with the temperatures being warmer in the field and transport to the packing house. This mainly is a consequence of what goes on in the field. Uh, and the insidious thing about compression bruising is that there is a very delayed effect. And we see that often as soft cherries in the marketplace. And, and that's why it's insidious. We don't see it until we get to the marketplace. If we look at uh, what happens or when we take cherries directly from the tree and we take cherries from the end of a packing line, we can see uh, in the first two weeks, or so that we see a lot of soft fruit. And the reason is that this fruit has sustained a lot of compression injury. And when we keep the fruit in the cold, this is at half a degree, over time the fruit gets firm so we don't see the soft fruit at longer uh, distance shipping points. However, we may see a lot of soft fruit in the near markets. So thinking about compression injury, it's actually more of an issue for uh, fruit that's going to be marketed locally or uh, regionally, which gets to the market within a week or so. So keep attention to that in ter terms of those markets. How to avoid com compression injury? Don't have bins or totes that are too deep. In other words, keep the uh, height of the fruit in the tote or bin 12 inches maximum, Sh shallower if you can do it. Uh, Make sure the pickers that don't, they don't excessively squeeze the fruit during harvest, in other words, picker training, uh, handle them by the stems. The other thing is if they have a container like a uh, corrugated plastic uh, uh, picking tote, ensure that they don't handle it a lot because those, those are not rigid uh, totes. And if you move them around, they will actually deform. And then that deformation will result in compression, bruising in the fruit. Laneways are an important issue, uh, and, and there are uh, laneways that often have ruts. Uh, it's important to think about not uh, having ruts in the laneways before you get to the tarmac. Uh, fill those ruts in, make that laneway smooth, because every bump causes the fruit to go up and down, and as they do that, there's an awful lot of compression injury that goes on. Not a lot of impact injury, but a lot of compression injury. And getting down to uh, reflective uh, tarps, so that silverization or light uh, uh, damage, sunlight damage to the fruit. We, we, the industry has adopted this for quite some time, so this is kind of redundant, but it's important to talk about anyway. Uh, we, we have designed these things to be uh, liners in bins with the white side facing the sun and 
silver side uh, facing the fruit, and this is the optimum way to do it. The white surface uh, is actually more reflective of heat than the silver surface. The silver surface will actually absorb heat from the fruit, transfer it through the tarp, and the white side will emit that heat. So uh, this is a technology that was developed by NASA, and that's why it works that way. It was designed to work that way. Uh, so the white side out. Uh, and you can see here, this is work from nearly 20 years ago, where we show uh, by having the fruit under the tarp at four weeks, uh, the fruit maintains a good freshly harvested appearance, whereas fruit that's not protected has brown stems and is darkened and is beginning to look very old. And the reason this tarp works is it keeps the fruit cool. If it's not kept under the tarp, the fruit can heat up quite a bit. Uh, and during transport, they can heat up on, in the tarmac, whereas if it's under the tarp, it stays cool. And also, we keep the humidity close to 100%. So in other words, we're keeping, keeping them in an ideal situation uh, by having them under the tarp. Uh, some, some people suggested that we can just hydrocool the fruit to, to, to re, re, regain the water content in the stems. And that would solve our problem. So we did some experiments where we looked at that, where we had uncovered fruit uh, hydrocooling. Yes, we increased the water content considerably. These are tarp protected uh, uh, stems, and and here we have more water uh, and and increase the water content of those stems. But in actual fact, when you look at the uh, number amount of browning that goes on, it doesn't matter whether we hydrocool or not we still get the same kind of stem browning. So in other words, whatever damage we've incurred in that uh, stem during harvest and handling to the packing house is irreversible. And we may be able to increase the water content, but that's not gonna change the fact that cells are damaged and we're gonna get that, that stem browning. Just looking at it one more time, I've turned the graph around here where the uh, completely brown uh, colors up at the top instead of at the bottom as in the previous graph just to show you we have less browning with the uh, tarp covered fruit whether we hydrocool or not and we have no matter whether we hydrocool or not we have more stem browning uh, uh, if we don't protect the fruit. Uh, bottom line is the tarp is essential to maintain that stem quality. Also, it's important to maintain fruit quality. We tend to get more decay in fruit that has not been protected by the tarp, whether we hydrocool or not. Another aspect, thinking about the marketplace and, and when we talk about acceptable water loss, 5% is the maximum water loss for sweet cherries. Uh, once we hit 5%, the fruit starts to, to uh, appear limp, uh, get soft because of water loss. And if we uh, look at uh, uh, keeping a fruit uh, in a protective shed, we see that we have much more uh, water loss. This is after uh, four weeks in storage. This is under the tarp, much less water loss. So we're keeping the water content of the fruit uh, similar to what it was when it was harvested by keeping it under the tarp. If we keep the fruit on, on, on covered uh, by, uh, by canopy in the, in the orchard, we exceed this 5% by four weeks, excuse me. Uh, and so we start to see a lot of soft fruit, uh, shriveled fruit in, uh, because of that. Whereas if we have the, in the field, we have tarp covering the cherries, we still maintain water loss at a very minimal amount after four weeks. So this is what I call the insurance value of the tarp. Basically, we're, we're giving this uh, cherry a lot more uh, storage or shelf, shelf life or shipping life because we're maintaining that, maintaining that water content in the fruit uh, for a longer period of time. And pitting is somewhat affected by use of the tarp. We can see here that when we use a tarp, we minimize the pitting. It doesn't uh, really uh, that significant, whereas we start to see uh, significant pitting if we don't use the tarp. And this is after uh, four weeks uh, storage. Bottom line is if we manage to harvest property and use reflective tarps, we get minimal stem browning. And this is two different growers uh, after early harvest and late harvest. And this was in, in, in Sweetheart. So it doesn't matter whether we harvest uh, 
beginning of the harvest or uh, at the end of the harvest for that variety, we still don't have significant browning. So we actually make the uh, potential for the crop uh, to be maximum in terms of stem quality by using this tarp. And just to see this picture one more time, uh, doesn't hurt to see some pictures more than once. We can see that with uncovered uh, cherries, they, they get dark, the stems go brown. If we protect them with the tarp, the stems stay green, they stay plump, and the fruits stay the similar color as the, when they were first harvested. So, harvested. so these things appear to ripen, get soft, uh, and get old, whereas the ones that are tarp, tarp covered, uh, this is after four weeks. And these aren't even hydrocooled, these, these fruit. Uh, we can see that the, the fruit are very good quality. And again, just some more of the same. Relative humidity, we keep it up near 100%. That's one of the magic things about this tarp. The other thing is we don't allow the fruit to get warm. And if we're traveling from the orchard to, to the packing house, one of the areas where we can get heating of the fruit is actually uh, from the orchard to the packing house, that tarmac. It's very hot on the roads at this time of year and the fruit will actually heat up and you have that air flowing across and if you don't have it protected by the tarp and, and the sun off the chair of cherries with the tarp, they will heat up and dry out. Different uh, orchards, different orchard grower combinations uh, result in different uh, lengths of time from time of harvest to, to the time of cooling. Uh, this is work I did many years ago with uh, six different types of systems and we had different times from harvest to final cooling. And in the ideal case, we're within a few hours here. Uh, intermediate case, that's uh, six hours, eight hours, which is probably quite often more normal uh, if you're not transporting from uh, Preston to, to the Okanagan. This is probably more typically, typically the case what you might see uh, in a situation for Creston. Uh, what happens with delays in, in, uh, in uh, uh, cooling? Well, the biggest thing that happens is loss of a, a triterial acidity. This is after harvest and after storage, and we can see that the acidity is reasonably good in both cases at harvest, but after storage, uh, if we have a delay of 24 hours, we have a fairly big drop in titratable acidity. That's flavor. Looking at a, a little more in depth, you can see that the, the fruits, uh, the sugar levels stay the same if we have immediate cooling, and so do the does the titratable acidity. If we delay uh, cooling of the fruit, we have slightly higher uh, soluble solids after that 24 hours uh, after that storage. Part of the reason is the fruit are uh, getting somewhat dehydrated. In other words, they're losing some water, so the sugar appears to be getting uh, higher in that fruit. However, the acidity levels drop significantly in that fruit. So we're losing that uh, balance of sugar to acidity, which is uh, resulting in, in a fruit that doesn't taste quite as good. You should stop picking for the day when your temperature reaches 27 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it just, you get to a point where the cooling that's required gets to be too much. The fruit are, are in a sage stage where they're gonna probably suffer an awful lot of compression injury if they're too warm. Uh, it won't, won't take very much to, to cause compression injury in that fruit. So you should stop picking around the, this threshold, 27 centigrade or 80 Fahrenheit, uh, and uh, try to get picking early as possible so you don't have to be picking later in the afternoon. Uh, ensure that the first fruit that you pick is the first fruit that goes to the cooling or receiving site. Just try to keep that uh, logistics going, that chronological uh, scenario going where first off, first, first in. Cover the fruit with reflective tarp immediately. That gives you some leeway, gives you some uh, ability to, to uh, delay uh, moving the fruit or have, have the fruit sitting before it's, it's cooled. And it's important to continually monitor 
and transfer charities to the cooling receiving site. Now it's, it becomes a, a big job, but uh, working uh, together with swampers and, and, a, and a field coordinator, you, you should be able to develop a system where you're uh, able to, to keep track of what's come, going on and, and moving the first fruit off to the packing house first. Thank you. I'm sorry if uh, you didn't hear a lot of that, so if there are questions, I'm willing to, to deal with that as well. Hello. Great, thank you very much, Peter. And um, we can open the floor for some questions if anyone would like to either uh, text into the chat or you can um, ask a question if you unmute yourself. Yeah, so Don Lowe here, I've got a couple questions. Okay, go ahead, Don. Um, so if we're taking fruit to a, a spot where we're hydro cooling, Peter, I guess it would be your recommendation that we recover that fruit after it's hydrocooled with the covers. If, uh, where is the fruit going to sit after it's hydrocooled? It, it'll likely sit at the hydrocooling station inside a plant for uh, up to four to six hours before it gets put on a truck, and then it's going to go another six hours to Kelowna. So is that that, that area cool or? Is it refrigerated or what, what's the, what's the? Yeah, it's, 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 it's refrigerated, it's uh, cool. Okay, this, uh, I, would, I would recommend taking the covers off because what'll happen uh, is uh, the fruit still respire and if it sits there, you'll probably get condensation on the fruit and it'll, it'll, it'll ca cause a bit of a mess. But uh, I, I like to think about not having water sitting on the fruit for too long because that encourages the uh, growth of, uh, fungi or decay. So uh, I, I would prefer to see the covers come off if it's in a cool area. Okay. And my second question is, um, you've probably had a lot of experience with the handgun uh, thermometers to take temperatures. Are there, are there some that are better than others? Or, you know, are, are they, are they reasonably, reasonably priced? <laughs> um, yeah. Not those kind of things. Okay. Uh, one of the things we, we, we discovered when we first started doing the work with uh, the Cherry Association many years ago was that uh, a lot of packing houses thought they had cold cherries. And, uh, and it's because they're walking around with a thermometer in their pocket in the cold room. And so they had these very uh, thick uh, diameter uh, probes for temperature. So that, that probe already was holding that cold. And so when it stuck in the cherry, it looked like the cherry was cold because the response time to warm up to the fruit temperature was so long it, that nobody would do that. So, uh, uh, but it doesn't really matter how thick that probe is as long as you uh, warm it up before you put it in the cherry so that you actually get an accurate temperature on the cherry. I think that's the important thing is to understand that if the uh, uh, probe is, is cold when you put it in, it's gonna take some time before it might warm up if your cherry is warmer than that. So you need to think about it that way. Okay, so out in the field then, the, uh, the, um, the probe ones that you stick in the cherry is better than the, than the infrared ones that just take a surface temperature? Uh, they'll, they might tell you two different things. If the, the cherry is exposed to the sun, the surface will always be warmer than the core. Right. Uh, and uh, I really haven't, worked it out in my mind which is the more important issue uh, but I, I would tend, tend to focus on on taking the pulp temperature if I could if you're doing a, a quick quick QC then then the surface probe will give you an indication of these fruits and warm or not but it may not tell you what the core temperature is good thank you Great, thanks Don for the questions. We had a couple others come in on the chat yeah. here. Um, Sarah, wondering if anyone has done work on reducing pitting specifically on lapins by not running uh, the fruit when really cold, zero to one degree Celsius. Well, uh, a lot of the packing houses that we're working with, they actually uh, do very similar to what you do at your receiving station up at Preston. 
they war war a cool the fruit to an intermediate temperature, something like six degrees Celsius. Uh, and and in the receiving uh, of a lot of these packing lines, the fruit is not put into really cold water until uh, later on in the packing line. So it's a two-stage cooling, which I, uh, this is great because you, you get a lot of the field heat out first, but you don't cool the fruit to the point where they can get easily damaged. That's five degrees is sort of when you start to see more damage, it's five degrees or lower. So, uh, but you need to cool the fruit before it goes in the box. So usually what happens is you, you have the intermediate cooling, uh, hand sorting if it has to happen, and then it goes through uh, final hydro cooling before it gets packed. So you minimize the damage by uh, doing the, the final stage cooling before the packing at that end. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, I think the, the, the uh, packing line that uh, BC Tree Fruits operates that way. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm pretty sure most of the other independent guys, they, they run their lines that way. I'm pretty sure. But I'm not absolutely certain. Great, thanks, Peter. Another question that came in uh, refers more to sanitation. And given the situation with COVID, would growers be better off to put the covers on at the weigh station, or should they put the covers on in the field as being picked? Yeah, it should be in the field as it's being picked. Uh, the damage will occur before you get to the weigh station. So uh, it doesn't take very long in the hot summer to go out to get that damage. And also, when you get that damage, you also have leakage of, of solutes uh, from the tissues, which will encourage the growth of uh, lots of uh, microbes, bacteria, fungi. Uh, so I, I would suggest that uh, you do it as it's being picked. Um, I have a question, Molly. It's Danny. Go ahead, Danny. Hi. Um, Peter, we pack our own fruit. Uh, we don't send it to the packing house. Yeah. Um, Sometimes if we've got a rain event coming, we'll pick more than we can process in a day yeah. to try and save from splits and then store it in the cooler overnight. And the cooler runs at about eight degrees to get that yeah. sort of medium. But what I typically do is I, I'll stack bins for high and then put a big plastic bag over them to try and keep the humidity up overnight so the cooler doesn't dehydrate them. But that you just mentioned that you don't think that's a good idea because it'll cause condensation. Okay condensation now uh, you, you put it through a hydro cooler the next day <clears throat> the next day yeah yeah when we pack it but i don't you're, hydro cool it when we overpick like that because i don't have the time no no you don't want to but you do want to keep the humidity up yeah uh, uh there are other ways to keep, keep the humidity up in the room by putting water on the floor but i'm not sure if there's a safety issue in regards to that i i do that too but i find like the the evaporators are so strong that they just I'll come in in the morning and it'll be bone dry in the whole cooler. So that yeah. I figure at that point, the stems are really getting hit hard by dehydration. Yeah. Uh, so you, do you hydro cool first thing in the morning? That's right. Yeah. Well, we have a dunk, we have a dunk tank, a hydro yeah. tank, and then they go up the elevator and onto the line, just like a normal. So it's a, within the first few hours of the next day you're doing that. Yeah. Okay. So you're minimizing uh, the potential problem there. Yeah. Doing that. So I'm okay. To, you think I'm okay to keep bagging the the bins overnight, keep the moisture in? Well, you, I don't think you have any choice. You have to make a compromise. I think it's like we can talk about what's ideal, yeah. and we can talk about the real situation. And so you you have to think about it that way. Uh, if you're going to put something a cover over it, and then you're going to uh, ship it for six hours down to the the Okanagan and and put it in a receiving area before it's hydro cooled, that, that's a different story. Yeah, no, that's not what we're doing. Yeah. So if, if, you're, if you're moving it into your packing line first thing in the morning, you're minimizing the possible issues that might occur. Because okay. the longer, longer it sits in that situation, uh, the worse the problem will get. And if the problems are gonna be uh, sort of fungus and yeah. kind of thing, yeah? Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. As opposed to pitting and softness? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you going? Are you going? Uh, uh, do you clean those covers regularly before you put them over the cherries? Uh, the you mean the plastic bags? Yeah. 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 We sanitize them with uh, bleach. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's the other thing to minimize the problems. Keep the spores under control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you, Peter.
Great, thanks for the question, Danny. We've got another question um, that has come in. Um, how how do growers how can growers best keep mylar covers from blowing off? Weighted covers are no longer available. Have you some strategies there, Peter? There are, there are some people that use uh, uh, Velcro fasteners. I think in some cases they staple one side to the side of uh, one one side of the bin, and then they use Velcro on the other side, tabs with Velcro on the other side to hold it down. Uh, you, you can always attach uh, webbing and, uh, and Velcro to the, uh, to the covers uh, to hold them down that way. I think the reason uh, a lot of these people went to Velcro is because uh, well, if they don't have the weighted covers, it uh, minimizes uh, the, the, uh, the comparison to the, the fruit if you have Velcro, it's rather relatively soft compared to other, other approaches like using maps or something like that, which could cause problems to your carry. Great. That, that's been an issue I couldn't see yesterday, but uh, uh, picking a design that everybody's happy with is another issue too. Do we have any other questions from anyone? Somebody asked about appeal. Oh, yes. That, uh, could you comment on what is appeal and whether there's any work being done with it? Uh, an appeal is, uh, uh, is uh, as far as I recall, is, is a coding. And uh, I haven't seen any, any uh, data that's exciting with, with appeal. I, I know there's a lot of hype with it. And uh, no, one, no one has come to me asking me to look at it. So I, I haven't looked at it. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if somebody wants to have a look at it, that could be done. But I, I found over the years, a lot of these different approaches to managing quality using coatings really is just to try to overcome the fact that we mistreated the cherry to begin with. Uh, and uh, if we do all of the, the handling and harvest in the field to protect the fruit from the sun, uh, Things like appeal may not be that important in the outcome at the end. I would think things like using smaller and the packing line would be of more use than things like appeal. Uh, when you look at the relative benefit and the cost. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I'll just perhaps make one last call for any questions here. If there's any others that would like to jump into the conversation. Hey, Molly, it's Ken. Hi, Ken. Go ahead. What is the optimum temperature that you you need before you transship in crew? So when it comes into a facility, it's hydrocooled and then transshipped for six hours. Uh you're talking about to to uh, packing house down in, the, uh, in Okanagan. Correct. Okay. I, I we talk. I talked to to Molly about that. What, what's happening in practice with what's going on in Preston right now? And they they cool to about six or eight degrees, I think. Uh, and I think that's about optimal uh, uh, if you keep the fruit under high humidity. Uh, getting it down any lower than that, uh, well, first of all, take quite a bit of effort and probably take overnight to cool things down that far. But the other thing is that uh, if you cool the fruit and warm them up, which will inevitably happen when you take it to a packing house down in the Okanagan, uh, every time you warm fruit up, it causes uh, problems and can lead to uh, further losses in, in, the, in the marketplace. So I like to, to say that once you start cooling, never go back up. If you can avoid it, uh, and and uh, the, uh, if you have a, a slight increase in temperature for a short period of time, that's fine. But if you're going to ship it down uh, six hours and it's a half a degree or zero degrees, and then it sits in the receiving area down there and warms up to ten degrees or so, then you're likely going to have problems with those cherries in the marketplace. So I think that the, what what you have going right now with practice in Preston is probably the optimal thing to do. Okay, thank you. 
so Don here with another question and leading from Ken. So the, if they're only cooled down to say uh, 10 or 12 degrees, um, that's, that's not enough, that's not optimal. And is that correct, uh, Peter? I would like to see them come down to, to about six if you could. Uh, you know, you know, even six would not be optimal if you want to talk about it that way because you want to get the troop cooled as quickly as possible down to half a degree or so. But in the situation you have, the, a few degrees more will actually result in, uh, in a better outcome for you. So if it's a 10 degree, degrees, you're going to probably have uh, faster growth of fungi and rock in, in the first, they get down to six degrees, uh, you reduce that and you still don't cool the fruit to the point where uh, the cooling and then the heating of the fruit becomes an issue. So uh, I think six is the best compromise. You know, you might get away with 10 if uh, it's really cool and fruit and, and, and the timing for everything is great. But like with using the tarp, you buy yourself some insurance by bringing it down to six degrees, a little bit extra insurance in terms of a leeway as to what could happen to the fruit when it goes down, down to the back of the nose. Would two degrees be optimal for you? Uh, I think two degrees would be too cold if you're going to if you're going to be shipping it down to a packing house uh, in the Okanagan, it would be too cold. Okay. Um, I have one other question, if that's all right. It's Danny again. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Danny. Uh, this one is more. Uh, a packaging question. So I've always used um, clips on my lifespan bags, but in the last couple of years, I'm getting pushback from some of my customers that the clips are damaging the cherries because um, there's no respiration. I don't know, Peter, if you guys have ever done any work on that, any opinion about whether clips for the bags are good or not? You're laughing. Is that because this is a issue? We've done it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I have to say it's, uh, at uh, Christine Dendy's uh, uh, packing house, uh, I learned a great deal about what can be done without having to use clips. And it's just amazing if you uh, wrap those uh, liners really well like they did, and I'm sure there's a lot more people in the industry that are doing that, but these guys were uh, the they were harvesters that go around, around the world. They go to Australia, New Zealand, uh, and South America packing cherries and when they when they fold those bags they actually get a better seal than they do with the clip i'm finding that uh, the, the clip quite often the seal isn't isn't very good and and it's because you're, you're basically bunching all all of the bag together and putting the clip on but there can still be kernels of, of air movement and and uh, your oxygen will will uh, go up you want your oxygen to come down to about six percent if you can but by folding, folding the bags, we actually found more consistent uh, atmospheres in in in, in the line to carries than by using the clips. It was just amazing. So uh, I I personally don't like the clips because I don't think they're effective. If uh, there's somebody willing to offer some training on how you fold it prop properly, I think that would be certainly a, a great asset to, to to the industry. But uh, this is, I think folding. It's going to result in very, very good outcomes, uh, and you don't have that clip to deal with. And so I'm sure the other thing that with buyers is that clip is just a hassle for them to remove, whereas if it's folded, it's easy to open that package. Convenient as well. Okay, the opposite answer of what I was expecting. Great. That's a good perspective. Thank you. Okay. That's a great question. Peter, do you think too with folding the bags? I mean, one of the things I observed when we were twisting and clipping, we you tend to roll the cherries around an awful lot if you're not being very careful. Yeah. So could that also increase your bruising and other things? Yes, it would. It certainly would. You're, you're quite right, Molly. I think that's, yeah. uh, 
simple is best. And the, uh, the other thing I noticed is, is uh, the time it takes for somebody to clip a bag versus somebody to fold a bag. Clip takes longer mm -hmm. than a fold. And then you're having to grab a clip or to drop a clip, whatever. It's, it's, you start thinking about all the things that happen when you start using clips and then you realize you're, you're, you're putting yourself in a situation where you're, you're encouraging mistakes to happen. Whereas if you fold a bag, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, interesting. Thanks, Peter. Are there any other questions for Peter? I think good discussion. I just hope everybody's ready for the season. I'm not sure how fast the cherries are coming along. This is like a normal year in the next week or so, you guys are going to be very busy. I guess Crest is a little bit later, you know, so it's going to be very busy, crazy. Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I think we reached the end of questions and definitely appreciate the time you spent with us this morning and sharing the information. And when's retirement? January. January? Oh, good. Well, I'm glad we'll have you with us through this season. And thanks for all that you've done, certainly for the industry and for the great uh, presentation today. It's been fun working with you guys. It's, uh, I learned a lot myself. So I have a different perspective on things than I used to. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Um, I think we are pretty close to just after eight, but Dwayne and I had discussed that we just wanted to make sure that whether there were any horticultural questions before we wrap up today's uh, meeting. And so I just wanted to give a, an opportunity if anyone had any questions or wanted to touch base on spray schedules or anything else. And if not, then we'll wrap up and let everyone get on with their day. So Don here, so are we, are we starting to see uh, uh, fruit flies in the sticky traps now? I haven't seen any yet in my place. So. I haven't had any reports yet, but I would anticipate that there may be some around. Has anyone so seen we, on theirs? So we've reached the degree days where we should be spraying, is that Yes, correct? we have, yes. Reached the right timing for spraying, but Dwayne, do you want to comment at all on that? Have you seen any? Um, I haven't had any reports myself and uh, I'm not <laughs> putting traps out in highly infested sites anymore where we would likely catch the first flies if they emerge. But uh, yeah, since we have reached the degree day accumulation, um, it would be time to begin spraying. Now, once the first uh, uh, fly is caught, there's usually a bit of uh, leeway there until um, mating occurs and egg laying and that leeway can be you know five to seven days and yeah, a little longer maybe in cooler seasons so um, the other thing is that uh, when first capture occurs that the population emergence is quite low at the beginning of the season so with later varieties that are green you know there there is a bit of cushion there and so we're we're always trying to minimize the <laughs> Frequent, there are a number of sprays that we put on in the season and that early start is maybe the opportunity to hold back a little bit, but certainly for varieties uh, that are coming on early, you wouldn't want to miss that early start. And especially if you're starting off with something like GF120, um, because uh, you want to be early to use that material and not be delaying. So anyway, uh, yeah, if we've reached the degree day accumulation, uh, people should be thinking about starting to spray or have that first spray on. So a, a question then too, is it time for a codling moss spray as well? Yes, we've just re, uh, reached the degree day accumulation for codling moss here in the valley as well. So uh, yeah, it's time to begin spraying for that. Are you talking about cherries, Don, or apples? <laughs> Cher cherries. Okay, yeah. Uh, we we have reached the degree day accumulation for for codling moth as well. Uh, I was going to ask if anybody has had confirmation on cherry fruitworm. Um, sample, if samples have been sent in or have any been found in Creston? 
Well, as I, I did send that, that sample in, I didn't get anything definitive back, but I am seeing certainly the same, same, what appears to be the same moth. I'm getting a couple every, you know, when I check every week. Um, so I, I'm, again, I told, as I told you doing, I'm presuming that's the cherry fruit worm, but I'm not absolutely sure. Sarah, if you're still on the call, are you, did, did you have confirmation of any on traps down in the South Okanagan? So you were looking into that and doing some of your own trapping. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, yeah, no, um, we had a really hot block in Soyuz last year on the border. And I think he just had been missing his leaf roller sprays or his petal fall sprays. And yeah, we had a lot of cherry fruit worm. It was sent into the ministry. It was identified as cherry fruit worm. Um, I did put some traps out this year. I have about six traps out and I was comparing uh, the false coddling moth lure uh, to the cherry fruit worm lure because work done, um, I think by Susanna and Riella CFIA showed that the false calling moth worked and that's what we're using for BC Cherry Association this year. Um, but what I've seen so far is both are, are actively catching with, with no discrepancy or issue. Out of the gate, I mean, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but I had really high numbers, like 20, 20 plus per trap uh, when I got them out shortly after we were all asked to put them out. So what was that? May fourth or something um and i got him to put a petal ball, petal fall spray on and the numbers have totally decreased and i and i just can't imagine it's it's an issue now so it seems that manageable it really does um i'm i'm checking them every friday and i'm getting zero as a number consistently for the past two weeks and now i'm keeping my eyes open um looking at the fruit for cherry fruit worm but he has such little crop in this block he got frosted out so that's kind of where it's at for me. Great, thank you very much for the update. Yep. Um, Dawn, I just wanted to say that I've trapped coddling moth over here. So they are out. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. sorry, um, I could comment. The, the moth emergence usually starts, uh, you know, around, Blossom time of apples uh, fairly early in the season, but it takes some time for the whole population to emerge and mating to occur and eggs to be laid. So that degree day model is trying to predict when a very low percentage of the eggs would have hatched and larva would have started to emerge. So um, trap captures, uh, you know, are useful to determine threshold levels for spraying, but the degree day model it really helps predict the emergence of uh, larva. So that's what we're targeting with, with our sprays. I think we might have a comment or a question from Lynn as well. Go ahead, Lynn. Hold on here just a moment, sorry. Uh, so, okay, you're, the comment was blueberry growers are also trapping for cherry fruit worm. So may find some information there. Great, thank you. We can keep following that up. Perfect. Are there any other comments, questions before we wrap up the meeting then? Excellent. All right. Well, a final thank you to Peter for joining us. Um, thanks for taking time this morning and for the presentation. And thanks, everyone, for the good conversation and questions. And I think next week's our final meeting um, that we have planned, eh, Dwayne? So. Yes, uh, Molly, and did you have a survey that you're um, Ooh, trying to <laughs> send it out? <laughs> yes, I will. I thank you for reminding me because I will send it out by email. And we're just looking for some feedback on how the meetings have gone and some topics and ideas for next season. So, yes, I will do that. Thanks, Dwayne. Is there anything else that we were meant to do today? <laughs> 
I think that's it. <laughs> great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, hopefully you'll join us next week. Uh, Dr. Matt Whiting's joining us to talk about uh, the UFO training system. So should be a good meeting as well. Excellent. Thank you, Ben.